I think the most important thing people have to understand is, as of right now, community action like you're doing here today is the only thing that's really available. So it's more than necessary. It's almost vital to it. Um, I'm not going to go into a long presentation like I usually do, but what I'm going to tell you briefly is, I, I just lost my son Emmett. He was 20 years old on April 20th, 2016. So two days ago was his six month anniversary. Now Emmett was a great kid. He uh, had a phenomenal life, phenomenal loving family, everything you could ask for. And, uh, but unfortunately he has the disease of substance use disorder. You know, you can't see it. There's no blood test for it. He just, you know, went through his childhood years and junior high with no issues. He went off to a private high school on a scholarship. It's called Catholic Memorial. And, you know, in high school, like most people, he started to experiment with marijuana. And uh, what happened was, because he has substance use disorder, over a period of time, his use increased. And he was, you know, always looking for greater highs. But he was always dedicated to school, played sports, was a great kid. Um, halfway through his sophomore year, after he'd been caught smoking pot once, his mother and I, you know, voiced our concerns, typical parental stuff, and he assured us it was a one-time thing, it would never happen again. But I had a sneaking suspicion that it was gonna happen again, and uh, a month or two later, I got a call from his school and he was permanently expelled. At that time, I brought him to live with me in Bridgewater, and I had him start attending a 12-step fellowship meeting, kinda as a punishment, not because I thought he had a severe problem, but kinda as a punishment, rather than, you know, grounding him or something. And over a six month period, he fought the treatment. <coughs> he didn't want to do it, excuse me. <coughs> but after six months, he gave into it. He started to do it. When he stopped using drugs and alcohol, his whole life changed. Turned right back around. He was always a good student, but once he stopped using, he became a phenomenal person. You know, he uh, graduated high school with a 4.27 GPA, National Honor Society, you know went to prom, did all the things that you, one would expect in high school. And when he left, he had a full academic scholarship to Worcester State. And uh, the summer of 2014 was probably like the most amazing summer of my life. You know, I was just so happy and full of uh, hope. And, you know, I remember the day I dropped him off at college, his mother and I were divorced, but we're the best of friends, always have been. And, uh, you know, there's pictures of us you know, hugging him. It's one of my Facebook profile pictures. It's always there. And uh, he was two years sober when I dropped him off. You know, and like within two days, he started drinking and growing. You know, being good parents, we saw what was going on social media. I saw what was happening. But to a degree, you know, I understand the disease of substance use disorder. I don't know how many people in this room do. I know some people do. But basically, what it is. You know, he has a physical allergy to alcohol and drugs. Like, he can't use any in safety because once he starts, he doesn't really know where it's gonna stop. You know, he has compulsive behaviors and, you know, obsessive thoughts about it. So even when he's not using it, he's thinking about it all the time. Now that doesn't mean he can't be successful and do well and, you know, get straight A's in school. He can, he's that type A kind of kid. He could still do that. But what happened was he started drinking and drugging and after about four weeks, because he was on a full academic scholarship, I didn't have to pay a nickel for him to go to college. So I used to put $50 in his bank account every week for spending money. And after four weeks of kind of seeing him party, and I said, listen, I'm not gonna keep putting $50 a week in your account if you're gonna keep using. And he said, hey, do what you gotta do. You know? So I, I stopped. What I didn't know was within two or three weeks of stopping, he immediately turned to heroin. You know, in Worcester, heroin is very prevalent. If you don't think it's in your town, it is, it's in every town. But in Worcester, it's really available and it's cheap. And, uh, you know, he didn't stop the old fat. I mean, he didn't stop the way most people do today on pain pills. They say, you know, 75% or so stop pain pills and eventually progress to heroin. But that didn't happen for him. Emmett was at a party. He was drinking, he smoked a pot, smoked some pot, and then some kid offered him a line. And because he'd done cocaine, he just thought it was another line. It wasn't, though. It was an opiate. He fell in love instantly, and you know, there began my journey downhill. You know, I don't know. what happened was by December of 2014, he overdosed for the first time. You know, I didn't at this time know he was using heroin. You know, he called me, 
said he was at the hospital, and the only reason he called me is because he knew I was going to get the co-payment bill. And he was terrified. Not of what had just happened to him, that he almost died, but that I would, I would get mad because I got a bill. You know, and he came home a week later after he finished his finals, and like I said, straight A's, you know, perfect grades. Came home, got him reacclimated into his recovery programs and around the same friends he'd been successful with. And everything looked good, you know. We were driving him out to Worcester all the time, trying to find him a group that he felt comfortable with. And uh, he assured his mother and I that, you know, it was a one-time thing, it would never happen again, and we didn't know the extent of it at this time. So please let him go back to school. So he did. This time he only lasted nine weeks. He went downhill immediately. You know, and he, uh, he told me he'd stay in communication with his mother and I, but the minute he got back to school, you know, he's 19 years old at this time, he just terminates communication. All he had, there's no way for us to call him. He has a cell phone. We can pay for it, but we can't make him answer it. And, uh, you know, and he called me in April of 2015, like, in terror. You know, like, I need to go to detox. I'm so sick. I'm, I want it, you know. So I took him to a um, detox on Cape Cod and unfortunately uh, the only program available was a seven-day program you know because there's not enough long-term treatment for this disease you know so after seven days he was you know sent back to our home and that was fine you know like I know what to do to help him try to get sober and try to surround him with people and put the right things in his life you know but he relapsed almost immediately like two or three days he went right back in second time he was in about five days, and we were fighting on the phone. He wanted to sign himself out. I told him not to sign himself out. Well, needless to say, on April 12, 2015, he signed himself out, texted me, said he was on his way home, and I was bullshit, as you can imagine. And I was sitting at my kitchen table when I got a phone call that my 30-year-old cousin Kyle had just overdosed and died from heroin. So on the day that my son signed himself out early from treatment, my cousin died. He was from Stoughton. I'm from a very small family. I only have six cousins. You know, and I sat with my son. I looked him in the face, and this is the power of the disease. You know, and I'm like, my son. I mean, I said, my cousin just overdosed and died, and you just signed yourself out of detox. And you can't see the correlation. You don't think that's a sign that you should do something? Nope. Because that's the power of the disease. And uh, you know. As parents, being terrified, what do we do? We did everything we could. We got him on this drug called Vivitrol, which is an opiate blocker, um, so that he can't feel the effects of opiates if he tries to use them. You know, he was in counseling, he was in treatment. Everything you could do as a parent. You know, all the resources available. And uh, I had him living with me, he got a job. I even took care of his money. I didn't want to have him have, him have too much money. And uh, what we didn't tell him, unfortunately, or unfortunately what we didn't tell him was his full academic scholarship to college. When we took him for treatment, we were able to medically suspend it because the college would recognize it as a problem. So we medically suspended his uh, scholarship with the hopes that he would once again get sober, get his life together, and then we could reactivate it and he could go to Bridgewater State or another school. I really didn't want him to go back to Worcester ever. But, you know, I, I basically was like, we'll give it a year and then we'll do something. He lived in my house from April till August. And about the third week of August, now he's a really smart kid, he figured out somehow on his own that he could reactivate the scholarship. And there was nothing I could do to stop him because he's an adult. So we got in a huge fight to the point where, you know, it was almost a fist fight. I told him to leave, you know, uh, oh, the police were going to help him leave. And, you know, he left, and he was mad at me, and I didn't talk to him from August of 2015 until November of 2015. You know, he was going to punish me. And, uh, you know, he calls me in mid-November 2015, he's like, Dad, you know, I just want you to know I'm doing great. I got a job. I was working on campus in the computer department. That's his major. Uh, he's going, I'm doing better in school than last semester. I'm going to make dean's list. You know, and it's, you know, the hope of a parent, you know, like, I know he's on Vivitrol, and I'm like, maybe he's really not using, you know? Because he kept saying, I'm sick of taking your drug tests, you know, I'm just going to smoke pot. But if you have substance use disorder, you, most people can't do that. That's all I'll say. 
you know, once it starts for him, it's always going to lead him back to his drug of choice, which is heroin. You know, and, but secretly I was really hopeful, you know. And two weeks after that phone call, sure enough, a, a letter came from Worcester State that was a dean's list certificate. He'd made the dean's list, like above a 4.0 in every class. You know, and Christmas came, and well, the, the next phone call came, and he was like, listen, everything's great, but I'm going to live at my girlfriend's parents' house this break. I'm not going to come home. And I got really, you know, worried, terrified, to be honest. And uh, what happened was I actually went to this girl's parents and told them the truth. He said, listen, my son has substance use disorder. You really can't believe anything he says. You know, he'll tell you everything's great, that we're bad parents and everything, but he really needs to come home and live with us because we need to get him into the treatment that he needs. And the guy looked at me in the face and he said, listen, it's none of your business what you tell me to do in my house. And there was nothing I could do, you know. I only saw my son once that break. He looked terrible. All I got to do is look at him and I know he's using him. And, uh, you know, it, you can't talk to him. His mother and I would just talk to him. Well, maybe we could do, don't talk to him. I don't want to hear it. You know, like, I'm just smoking pot. Leave me alone. I saw my son on April 11th. One last time, because from January to April, I'd been begging him just to come down for a visit. You know, and he promised me he'd come down and stay over one night. He showed up late. He didn't want to be there. They were, both he and his girlfriend were both strung out. And, uh, but I was happy to see him. And I'm usually a really tough love parent, to be honest with you. Really hard. And uh, about two or three hours on the visit, he's picking fights with his brother. He's picking fights with my girlfriend. He's just looking for a reason to leave, and I understand that. And for some reason on that day, I started yelling at him, or taking a swing at him, or whatever. I hugged him. I told him I loved him. I asked him to please not shoot dope and come home in two weeks. He was dead nine days later. You know, he couldn't stop. And today I know, like, the stigma of the disease is what killed my son. You know, his use directly, he's not, you know, blameless in this, but the stigma of it. My son was too embarrassed to tell me again that he needed to leave school. You know, that he needed help. He thought I would be disappointed in him because he might lose his scholarship. I could care less if he lost his scholarship. But that's the stigma, so I got As soon as he died, his mother and I decided we weren't going to do the typical thing, which you see so often in the newspaper or an obituary online, is, you know, he died suddenly or unexpectedly. Look, kids in their teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s, adults, men, women, <coughs> young, old, really doesn't matter, they don't die suddenly. You know, or unexpectedly. I'm, I'm sure that happens once in a million. But all those things you see in the paper, substance use disorder, killing people. You know, and the thing we decided from the very beginning is we were going to use it as an educational tool to try to help other parents see the truth, or to try to help the general public see the truth, which is, and I know everyone in here that's listening cares, because you're here. But one of the hardest things to realize, and I'm, I was terrible at it when I first started too, was like, I can't use stigmatizing terms. I can't call it addict or abuser or junkie, or that's the worst one, or anything like that. Whether you believe it or not, using those negative terms is a self-perpetuating thing. The more you say it, the more people look at it badly. You know, for every person in here, there's 5,000 out there that don't believe this is a disease. That's just a fact. Sad, but it is. So what we did was, you know, put it through Facebook, through the news, we made national news, and just to try to raise awareness that a substance use disorder, that can happen to anyone. You know, like, Emmett's story is important to, you know, my family, but really that's it. Like, I don't beat the drum for my son. I try to go out and speak at high schools and colleges, try to mainly, believe it or not, speak to the kids, because the reality is, I don't know, you know, how many people our age are going to change, change their opinions. I mean, there'll always be some, but it's very difficult. You know, like Steve mentioned, I was just that fed up in Washington, D.C. And, uh, I, you know, it's the first time I went, and I was angry, because there's nothing being done, you know? It's, it's basically 1984 of the AIDS crisis is where we're at today. That's where we are. And, you know, it's basically small grassroots things like this that are the beginning of it. And, you know, and I think it's phenomenal, you know, what you're doing, and you have to do it. 
and you know what we all have to do that I tell everybody I'm not gonna go through the rest but the most important thing you can do is talk to other people you know use the right terminology and talk to other people you know like me having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone is a much easier way for me to convince them and make them understand the reality of this disease because until the general public believes what we believe nothing's gonna change you know that's the sad truth you know and unlike the LGBTQ community people with substance use disorder do not stick together you know they're, they're like the antithesis of it you know the gay community was so strong they stuck together they got everything that they needed it took some time but they got everything they needed in SUD it's the exact opposite first of all people don't even want to admit they have it you know people that need treatment won't seek it you know, they say that only one in twelve people that need treatment even seek it and that we only have enough capability for like one in 84, you know, so. But the reality is, you know, I, today I just try to do whatever I can. You know, like I speak out all the time. I'm going to Charlotte in a week and a half or something to speak at five high schools down there. And, you know, I don't charge anything. I do it out, you know, for free. Because I truthfully believe, like, the only reason I'm doing it, I have another son, Zachary, who also got a full academic scholarship and doesn't drink a drug. You know, the opposite of his brother. You know, but I'm so lucky because, you know, I still have someone else. There's so many parents that lose their own child. It's so sad. But, you know, again, what I would suggest is, you know, any chance you get to talk to someone, you know, please do. Uh, like Steve mentioned, I started a little thing. It's just hopesforever.org. My website's just being finished up. It'll be live next week. And, uh, I try to provide free resources. It doesn't cost anything. We don't seek donations. Everything's free. Just to try to educate the public. So if you know someone personally that's struggling and needs help, you know, please talk to the people from Bay State before you leave. You know, talk to me, join the group. There's all kinds of resources available, you know. And you know, I guess I'll close with this. It's like, you know, the hardest thing as a parent, you know, uh, especially a parent of loss, is to be able to get up and talk about it. And, you know, my aunt, oh, actually there's a couple people here, but we volunteer at a thing called EB Hope. It's in East Bridgewater. And it's a community organization that provides services to people, you know, with substance use disorder, both families and, you know, people suffering from the disease. And, you know, the, I was talking to my aunt Debbie who lost her son Kyle, my cousin. You know, one week before my son died, I was talking to her about speaking out coming to this meeting and talking to people and she said, Bill, I can't do it. I'm not ready. And then a week later, my son was gone. And so I had to do it. I had to do it and I got to continue to do it. And uh, if you come across people, you know, that have lost a son or a daughter or a loved one and they want to talk to someone, please direct them to me. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve.